Rossella. Ja, det er det. Samaj 
Shikshan, Swabhiman, and Sukarna in tier 4 and came to be reconstituted by Dalit women in the Ambedkar movement. In the process, I uncover how they intentionally performed emotional dignity, demanded formal education, and sought improvement. Dalit women used their vernacular Marathi concepts to constantly disrupt and dissent the dominant discourse and elite Brahmanical hegemonic practices and unsettle the latter's dream of establishing a perfect order. The interlocking technologies, as I call them, of caste, class, gender, family, community, and modern secular education shaped and in turn were transformed by ordinary Dalit women's choices, intimate desires, emotions, and everyday negotiations at particular historical and political conjunctions. Leaders, activists, and ordinary Dalit women sought to rearrange the shifting political and social conditions in order to reform their subjectivities, develop dignity, and make choices. At the same time, there were tensions because Sudharana and Vikas also had different implications for different subcasts of the Dalit community. Because as you are all already aware, Dalits had their own and have their own internal hierarchy of castes. Efforts at Dalit women's radicalism were also undercut by the desire for bourgeois respectability and upward mobility. By examining how Dalit women's subjectivity was constructed, I address several important blind spots in the national history of India as well as in that of the women's movement. The colonial government, social reform movements, and the feminist movement were little concerned with the Dalit question and denied Dalits a space to critique caste, gender, and untouchable. Moreover, unlike middle class, upper caste women, Dalit women never figured as subjects or agents in historical accounts of the anti-colonial nationalist struggle or of women's reforms. Ambedkar and Dalit women's political strategy then centered on the radical remaking of the self and construction of subjectivity so that it was not merely a recovery of women as feminist historians have argued in the context of imperial and elite Indian women. Nonetheless, there were limitations to Ambedkar's radical techniques. Radical men's anxieties and contradictions affected many Dalit women. Yet, women have continued to carve their faces, even if small, for themselves. I'll now move on to the agenda, to this the Brahmi agenda of education, which manage difference in the field of education. Indian social reformers, Christian missionaries, philanthropic foreigners, and the British government were the four main agents of women's education during the 19th century. Men vibrantly discussed both the social position and the gender of women's education in the print culture. As educators, editors, and critics, Brahmins controlled the dissemination of the new medium of modernity. They dominated over walks of life and thus shaped new debates over society, culture, and politics. They also constructed the agenda for women's education within the context of middle-class domesticity of women's traditional family roles as supatni, that is, good wives, and sumata, that is, good mothers. We are completing this circle in the 21st century, right? By deviating the reform of three shiksha, that is, women's education, and tying it to child care, rationalized home management and sexuality, nationalists at the turn of the 20th century, like their imperial counterparts, identified domesticity as the core of society. This emerging Brahman male vision of the ideal in the woman, the new woman was to appropriate the modern in limited ways, nurture her upper caste cultural values, and maintain her distance from lower caste or class vulgar women who were different and performed menial tasks. In the process, elite nationalists projected the chaste, virtuous, 
exclusive Brahman woman, as the normative married woman, and as the asexual symbol of the Hindu Indian nation. This social construction of women and gendered roles further exacerbate, exacerbated caste differences and systematically stimulated the Brahmanization of Indian culture. Moreover, there was a major concern with women's difference that resulted in much public reading about curricula, syllabi, textbooks, and even the best location for girls' education. Male Brahman reformers, as well as some women, for example, questioned the usefulness of algebra and geometry for women. Even the great radical extremists, B. G. Turk as Bal Gangadhar Turk, turned a modest moderate when it came to women's education and curriculum. More significantly, many elite reformers in the Bombay legislature argued that it would be immoral to send upper caste girls to school on their own and expressed fears about their daughter's safety. Some also question, and I quote, if all women are sent to school, who will do the cooking? And how is one to find maids or housework? Some reformers thus placed their own luxuries first and emphasized that education was not necessary for women of all classes and castes because some castes and classes were fit to do only certain kinds of jobs. In so doing, they actually constructed and cunningly managed difference between different castes and genders. I now want to move on to the Dalit agenda of education, which actually inculcated critical thinking. Challenging some elite Brahmins, Brahmanization, and construction of difference, the containing of education to their caste community 